Good morning. Well, I'm feeling pretty good, uh, you know, even though I've got a little baby in the house now. Um, I'm, I'm sleeping well. Yeah, praise God. I'm sleeping pretty good. Everyone asks me, like, how I'm doing. I'm like, I'm fine. I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to try and feed this kid because my body can't do that. Um, that's just not the way that God designed me. So, again, as you guys are turning to Acts 17, uh, we're going to start at verse 16. While you're turning to Acts 17, I just want to say I'm really grateful to be able to speak on this subject, the gospel and culture. It's something that's really near and dear to my heart. I actually went to school to get a degree in anthropology, which was not my intention when I first started college. When I first started college, it was just to get a degree. And then three years into community college, you're like, okay, you should probably like pick a major now. And I'm like, all right, uh, well, what can I get out of here fastest with? And they're like, well, you've got lots of humanities. Uh, you've got, you know, enough to pretty much go next semester to do philosophy, or you can do anthropology. I'm like, philosophy sounds awesome. And they're like, it's in Northridge. The CI does not have a philosophy degree. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound awesome anymore because I don't want to commute to Northridge and I don't want to do online school. What's left? And literally the last thing that was left was anthropology because Channel Islands University um, had a program there. So I'm like, all right, uh, I guess I'll do that. And so I just kind of like fell into that major. It wasn't like this you know, oh, this has been my life's passion, my dream forever. And I was a pretty new believer at the time, so I, didn't, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do with life or what I wanted out of life. And anthropology is this really cool discipline. It includes archaeology. It includes cultural studies. It includes biological studies. It includes linguistics. And I didn't have, you know, a Christian education really at any point in my life. I think I went to a Christian preschool when I was really young, but I didn't really remember anything about that. And so... You know, kind of the rhetoric at the time was like, oh, be ready in college, you know, like, that's where a lot of people lose their faith. And I found the opposite to be true, even though, like, statistically, like, young believer going to a secular university, like, oh, he's a goner. Like, there's, there's no way he's getting out of this. But, you know, kind of talking about what Bruce was talking about last week with gospel and culture, gospel and community, rather, I was surrounded by a godly community that was able to help me navigate a lot of these things. And my faith grew in college. My faith grew while attending a secular car college. My faith grew while working in jobs that were not of a Christian nature because I saw God in every part of culture, in every single human culture on earth. It was, it was amazing. I saw God in nature in my zoology class. I saw God just in the design of the human body and in other living beings. And I saw God even in every single culture on earth. It didn't matter if it was a barely contacted tribe deep in the Amazon. I saw elements of the gospel truth in every single culture. And so I'm really excited to talk to you guys about that today because what we're going to talk about today is using the gospel to preach the culture. That's amazing. Like You can actually use the gospel to preach to the culture, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And I was listening to a pastor, someone I really respect, and I disagree with them on a lot of things, and I've never met them before, so they probably don't care. Um, but it's someone that I disagree with on a lot of things, but I really like on the things where he gets right. And he actually specifically said, I'm going to vow to not use the culture as a bridge to preach the gospel because he thought it was compromising. It's not compromising, guys. There's gospel, biblical truth everywhere if we have the Holy Spirit eyes to see it and if we are rooted in the Word. So that's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn how the truth of the gospel finds many parallels in every culture on earth. And Paul's going to actually show us this in Acts 17, starting at verse 16. I'm going to pray and ask God to just speak through me this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for just my background, even though I wasn't planning on being in ministry, really, even though I didn't even know why I was getting a degree in anthropology. Um, you did. Um, you did, and as we see today, you ordain all of human history so that we would seek you out, Lord. So I thank you so much, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So please turn your Bibles or your phones, your iPads, whatever devices you guys have. Um, we're going to be in again, Acts 17, starting at verse 16 to 21, we're going to talk about the mission. So let me give you a little bit of context first. We're in the city of Athens in Greece. It's about 49 AD, roughly 2,000 years ago. And this is mainly centered on the Apostle Paul. But there's also some Jewish and Gentile worshipers. 
We've got people in the marketplace, and then we have some Athenian philosophers. So that's our setting. Those are our people that we're going to talk about today. And why Paul's in Athens was because he was forced out of Thessalonica due to the preaching of the gospel. The people were offended at the message of the gospel, and so he was kicked out, which is interesting because if you know anything about Paul, he was a persecutor of the church. He was public enemy number one against the church of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus was like, now actually you're going to work for me. And so now Paul is an apostle mainly to Gentiles, but also Jewish believers. And so he's got kicked out of Thessalonica, got escorted out of there by his ministry partners, and now he's just waiting in Athens for his ministry partners, um, Timothy and Silas. A little bit about Athens, not a huge history lesson, but it's really important, I think, for the nature of this message. It is widely considered to be the birthplace of modern Western civilization. Everything from art and culture even down to its military, we still glean from a lot. I mean, its military was able to hold off Sparta for a long time. Like, if you guys know anything about history, you know that Sparta, those guys were awesome. And so for Athens to be able to hold them off is really impressive. In fact, our government is largely based on the Athenian model of democracy. When democracy was first introduced by the Athenians, democracy was like, Basically a slur. Like it was basically like you would, oh, that place over there, it's a total democracy. Like the people are in charge and they make decisions. It's silly. It's ridiculous. We get our ideals of democracy from Athens. It was also the hub of all the Greek philosophers um, whose ideas still saturate the culture today, as we're going to see later on. So Paul's about to preach the gospel to this culture. And this culture that he's preaching to is much like our own today. So first we've got to identify the problem. Um, Every mission is trying to solve a problem. The problem is idolatry in verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Um, This word given over to idols is actually one word in the Greek. The author Luke literally invented the word to describe just how idolatrous the city was. Like there wasn't a word that existed to explain just how swamped with idols this place was. So Luke had to make one up. And Paul is stirred in the deepest part of him when he sees the idolatry in this city. Really, let's give a quick definition of idolatry. It's just worshiping anything other than the true and living God in our hearts. Putting anything before God in our hearts. And it doesn't have to be explicitly spiritual. It doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be a false religion or anything like that. Even coveting something is idolatry. Just deeply desiring something that is not ours. Colossians 3.5 says that that even is idolatry. All sin is essentially tied back to idolatry. When we sin, we're rebelling against God and we're putting something else on the throne of our hearts and choosing to follow our own passions. And sin is not just like, oopsie, I messed up. Sin is responsible for all the death, all the suffering, all the pain in our world. And the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. And not just death as in physical death, but this spiritual, eternal death. That is what is the result of sin. Now there's a solution, and the gospel is the solution. That is the good news, that death does not have to be the final word. Jesus died to atone for our sins, and he rose so that we may have eternal life. That's what we're going to be all about next week. We, as Jesus followers, though, should be always about that. We are all missionaries, in a sense who are called to preach, which is just passionately communicating the good news to all people. So what is Paul going to do in response to all this idolatry? He says he's stirred. What, what's, what are his next steps? So we're going to see that in the goal, which is in verse 17, that we reconcile people to God. Verse 17, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. How does Paul respond? He responds, by obeying Jesus and being about the Great Commission, about preaching the gospel to all nations and making disciples of all nations. He didn't focus on the idols. He didn't go around saying, that one's wrong and that's demonic and that's wrong and you're wrong. He didn't go to the city hall. He wasn't trying to basically legislate that we get rid of all these idols. That wasn't his plan. His plan, the way that he accomplished this mission is by simply preaching the gospel. And I love how it says in verse 17 that he reasoned with people. He wasn't just yelling at people. And the first place he goes to is the Jewish and Gentile worshipers. The first place he, the first people he talks to are people who believe in God generally, right? That's 
pretty relevant to our culture. We would live in what is known as a post-Christian culture, right? At one time, this country was very religious in nature, and it was very Christian in nature, and slowly but surely, people and younger people and younger people have started to leave the faith, and so that's why we say it is a post-Christian culture, but a lot of people still believe in God. Before I was a Christian, I believed in God. I, was, I identified as agnostic, which I'll get into more, but believing in God is not enough to save people from sin. Like, that's a good start, but belief in God isn't enough to make us right with him. James 2, 19 says that the demons believe in God. Demons believe in God. Doesn't mean they're right with him. Believing in God is not enough to make us right with God. Like, if you're in an argument with someone, um, just because you know that they exist doesn't mean, like, you guys are cool anymore. Like, that'd be, it's kind of weird if you're, like, if you got beef with someone, you're like, you know, I don't even believe you exist. It's like, okay, it's kind of weird. It's like, okay, I've, I've recognized that you exist now, but I still hate you. Okay, so like belief in God is not enough to make us right with anyone, let alone God. And it says that Paul reasoned with those in the marketplace. Basically, anywhere he could, with anyone who would listen, he would reason with them. He wasn't just railing at them. It was reasonable. It was logical. He was explaining the gospel to people, as we'll see. We don't have to be evangelists also to give our testimony, like the story of God in our lives. I used to be really big about the scientific and the historical evidences for the faith, which are all extremely important. But when I'm talking to people one-on-one, it's more just what God has done in my life because you really can't argue that. You really can't argue like my experience, my actual relationship back and forth with God. So what specifically is Paul saying to people? We're going to see this in the means of accomplishing our mission, which is preach Jesus. Verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all Athenians and and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to tell or to hear some new thing. So what was Paul saying? According to this, he was simply just telling the people the story of Jesus and the resurrection. That's it. That's all it takes to be saved from sin and death is faith in Jesus and the resurrection. The message was heard by Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, and they, some of them thought he was crazy. Like They called him a babbler. Like It says that Paul was clearly preaching the resurrection of Jesus, and people thought he was out of his mind bonkers. Some people thought he was just preaching another religion, right? I, I feel that one a lot. Like when you're talking to people about Jesus, like, okay, he's just another religious guy. He's just one of those guys, you know, like, like Buddhists or Hinduists or Jewish people. Like they, they've just found something that works for them. They've found something that gives them peace and teaches them to be a good person, right? It's just another religion. Even though Paul was clearly preaching the gospel, he was misunderstood. And by Stoic and Epicurean philosophers who were very, very, very smart people. Even though they misunderstood, though, they still wanted to hear it because it was strange and new to them. Because it was strange, they actually wanted to hear it. Can we be honest for a second and just recognize that if you don't believe in Jesus for salvation, what we're basically saying is we believe that a Jewish carpenter roughly 2,000 years ago was also God and was born of a virgin birth and died and rose again after three days. And that if we place our faith in that, we will live in eternal bliss with the God of the universe forever and ever. That is the gospel. That is kind of strange if you're not used to that idea. Like We, let, we can be honest, that's strange. The Bible says it is foolishness to those who are perishing. And we can actually count on that strangeness for people to want to hear it and listen to it. And on it being new, a lot of us take for granted that a lot of people in this culture do not know really anything about Christianity except for what they see in the media, which I would not suggest at all is very accurate. Like, we live in a post-Christian world. We take for granted that most people have not ever heard the gospel in its pure and unadulterated form. We can count on it being strange and new to people that people actually do want to hear it, even if they mock us, even if they call us babblers. 
We shouldn't try and seem normal because to the world, we're not normal. The gospel is foolishness to those who don't believe. And you know what? That worked in Paul's favor because normal wasn't doing it anymore for these philosophers. Their philosophers, these philosophies that they ascribed to were not bringing them peace and happiness like they thought it would. The Epicureans pursued pleasure through the avoidance of pain and through seeking comfort. And the Stoics pursued morals and virtues. I mean, really, at the end of the day, isn't that what everyone's doing? They're either just trying to seek pleasure, avoid pain, or they're just trying to be a good person. They're trying to be a good moral person. But it's not enough. It's not enough to grant us eternal life. And so, and it's actually not even enough to satisfy us. Eternal life doesn't just mean living forever after you die. Eternal life means living richly, having life of an eternal quality and not just quantity. I think we're all looking for that. And we have found that through faith in Jesus Christ, but most of the world hasn't, especially in Southern California. All people on earth either pursue living the good life or being a good person. So here's how Paul preached the message of Jesus to a culture a lot like our own. So we're going to talk about the message, and in verses 22 to 23, we're going to see how to first observe the culture. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the middle, the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. That's really bold. Let's break this down. So Paul starts off by calling them religious. He says, I perceive that you are very religious. Religious is a neutral term. It's not good. It's not bad. Um, I'm, you know, called by a lot of people, I'm, and I'm sure you can relate to this. You know, if someone in your family who doesn't believe in Jesus describes you, they probably call you, oh, they're really religious. They go to church every Sunday. They're really religious. They believe, and I just, I don't like the way that fits. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I'm sure most of you do too. I don't love being called religious. And it's, it's a neutral thing. Being religious is not either good nor bad. And being religious doesn't even mean that your religion is to worship the God of the Bible. It just is. Now, what's really interesting is that these philosophers probably didn't identify as being religious either. They probably wanted to be identified as wise. That's what the Greek philosophers were attempting to do is they were attempting to seek wisdom above all else. But Paul's pointing out a universal human truth that everybody is, in a sense, religious. Everybody, in a sense, devotes themselves to something greater than themselves or something they think is greater than themselves, even if that thing is just an idealized version of themselves. Everyone devotes themselves to something. There's not a single person that doesn't devote themselves to anything. One's religion is simply what they devote themselves to, and so he points this out. And he says that he was considering the objects of their worship. That is really interesting to me. Paul is actually observing their culture. He was taking it in. He was even observing their religion. He wasn't just going, no, that's not true, so I can't look at that. Paul knows, because Jesus said it, that nothing that goes in man corrupts him. It's what comes out of man that corrupts him. Right? Seeing a, a statue of Vishnu in the background of a TV show is not going to, oh no, now I saw a demon. And that's not how it works. It's not what goes into man that corrupts him, but what comes out of man. Seriously, the, the forums I've read from people who are like, anyway, I won't, I won't go down that road right now. But, so Paul is actually walking around and he's seeing these little altars and he's seeing these statues of Zeus and Aphrodite and Athena and he's considering them. Like, he's actually taking them in. He's not adopting them. He's like, yeah, I'm going to worship Athena now. I'm going to worship Zeus now. But he's seeing what it is about them that compels people. Like, why do people worship these things? He's actually thinking about it. He's looking at it through a biblical worldview. And he's trying to understand these people through their culture and through their religion. It's not our job to figure out what's okay and what's not okay. Like, this is off grounds because it talks about magic. This is off ground because it's kind of new agey. This is off grounds because I just don't like the sound of that guy's voice, and I'm sure Jesus doesn't either. Right? That's not our job to go around and just, like, be spiritual sheriffs of the culture and of media and art. Now, what's really interesting is that he starts to talk about this unknown God. I found an altar with the inscription, To the Unknown God. It was a specific deity, actually. It, it could mean one of two things. It could either mean like 
Here's an altar to the whoever God we forgot, and we just want to make sure all of our bases are covered. That's one aspect of it. But there's another aspect where in Athens specifically, a couple hundred years before, there was a really horrible plague that was running around. It made COVID look like a joke, right? This was a real plague. Lots and lots and lots of people were dying, a large percentage of the culture or of the people. And so a guy came through that we're going to learn about in a little bit who according to some commentators, rose these little altars to an unknown God to save them from this disease. So this was a specific deity. They just didn't have a name for him yet. They didn't know who this God was. The unknown God literally means the agnostos theos, the agnostic God. Lots of people, including myself before Jesus, identify as agnostic in this country. Basically just means, not even in this country, in Western culture, an agnostic basically means There might be a God. Who knows? But really, it's there might be a God. Who knows or who really cares? And so Paul is talking to those people. And he makes the bold claim that they're actually worshiping the true and living God without knowing it. That's wild to me. It doesn't make them right with God, though. Again, just believing in God, believing that God exists does not mean like you and him are cool. And even here, incidental and accidental worship of God does not make you right with him either. Either. Just because you sing a worship song, just because you really like the song Amazing Grace and you sing it every so often does not make someone right with God. Just because you appreciate nature and the cosmos and you see beauty in it does not mean that you're right with the true living God. It doesn't make someone right with God. You have to believe in Jesus for salvation. And so Paul kind of starts with this cultural bridge, and now he's going to start with God. Now he's, he's made a connection through the culture, through a super godless culture, and now he's going to start with God. In verse 24 and 25, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So God or rather, Paul quickly just says five things about the nature of God. One, that he's creator of all things. He's Lord of everything. He's omnipresent, which just means he's everywhere. He doesn't need anything. He's independent in the truest sense. And he is the source of all life. Now, to the Greeks, that was a pretty wild set of concepts, right? Like, they worship Zeus, who was not the maker of all things. Right? There were gods before Zeus called the Titans, and then Zeus and his siblings all took down the Titans. And so the same gods in their mythologies that created the world didn't necessarily rule over the world because people made the Greek gods in their own image. And what people do is they usurp kingdoms and stuff like that. So not, though, the God of the universe, the true and living God. He's creator and Lord. He's everywhere. He doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything from us and he is the source of all life. These are still novel ideas today. These are still radically, radically challenging ideas. And I just want to say real quick, it is not our job to make people believe in God. It's not. It's not, like if someone denies the existence of God, it's not your job to know all the scientific arguments and all the evidences. It's good to know those things if someone asks why you believe, but it's not necessary. God has already made himself known to mankind. In Romans 1, it says, at verses 18 and 19, that what can be made known about God has been made known through the things that are seen, through creation. If you can walk through a forest or you can look up into the night sky without thinking that there might be something up there, like if, if creation can't convince someone of the existence of God, I don't think any of us can. None of our arguments, none of our spoken arguments are as compelling as the argument of creation and nature and the universe and the fact that there's order in the universe. But even belief in these basic truths are not enough to impart eternal life. So Paul continues, now that he started with God, he's going to connect God to people. Verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I love that part. I love just that passage right there. Many say that Christianity is just having a relationship 
with God. And in a sense, that's true. It's having a right relationship with God. It is a back and forth, right? God loves and we worship and love him back and it's supposed to be this reciprocating thing. But everyone has a relationship with God in a sense, whether or not they believe in him. They just have an estranged relationship. And so God kind of explains his relationship with all of mankind, regardless if they believe in him and trust in Jesus. And he says five more statements. One, God made one human race. I love that. He made one people from one blood, and he caused the human race to be diverse. We see that at the Tower of Babel. God ordained the history of every nation on earth. History truly is his story. God ordained all of human history so that we would seek him. And he's not far from anyone. These truths are relevant to every person. They're relevant to every culture and every place for all of human history. This is true for everyone, that he is not far from anyone, that he ordained all of human history. Right? History is not just a bunch of dates and dead guys. It is the story of God making himself available to all of mankind. God loves people so much he orchestrated all of history so that we would believe in his son and live forever. And God has also put eternity in everyone's hearts. We see this in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He's put this eternity-sized hole in all of our hearts that only God can fill. And every culture on earth reflects this. So now Paul's going to demonstrate how to use the culture as a bridge to connect God to the culture. So now we just are revealing God in culture in verses 28 to 29. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. This is a really crazy part. Okay, get ready. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. That's got little quotes there because Paul's quoting a guy named Epimenides. All these guys just have such cool names. Like the Cleases and the, the Dezes. I love these ancient Greek names. Epimenides was not a Jewish person. He was not a Christian person. He was a pagan. He believed in false gods. And he was credited by some commentators of has, as having saved Athens from a plague by erecting some altars to an unknown god. But regardless, he was known by those philosophers for sure. He was known in the culture and he was known to Paul. And rather than Paul being like, hey, you know that Epimenides guy? Yeah, he's dumb. He doesn't know what real truth is. He didn't believe in Jesus. And so you should just discredit everything that guy ever said. That's not what Paul does. He actually, this part where he says, and we are his offspring, he's quoting Epimenides, and he's quoting a hymn to the Greek god Zeus. Which is kind of crazy, because Zeus and the god of Israel are two very different gods. One, Zeus doesn't exist. And two, even if he did, he was absolutely brutal, and he slept with whoever he wanted. He would become like an animal and engage in that too, which was just bizarre. Like, people with too much free time will come up with some really weird stories and religions and stuff like that. But Paul sees just a shred of truth, even if it's attributed to the wrong God. And he attributes it to the God of Israel. That is amazing. He was not afraid to take in the co- content from the culture and actually use it to relate God and people, to connect culture and God, so long as he actively looked for biblical truth. So long as he was rooted in the word, so long as he knew a biblical worldview, he was not afraid to look at things that were not explicitly Christian or biblical or Jewish. He wasn't afraid to look at those things and say, where is God's truth in this? In this hymn to a false God, where is the truth in it? Biblical truth does not just exist in Scripture. We know something is biblical truth because of Scripture, But that doesn't mean that that's the only place you ever find biblical truth. Culture can be used to point back to God and the gospel so long as we're rooted in his word. We are God's offspring in the sense that he made us in his image and in his likeness. That's true. Let me go back for just one second. Uh, On this culture thing, on using cultural content to preach the gospel. Um, I'll give you guys a couple examples. Um, Let's start with Star Wars, for example, right? 
um, one of the biggest franchises of all time. Actually, Pokemon is the greatest franchise of all time. And I'm really upset about that because I had all the cards growing up. I had all the little knickknacks. You go to Burger King and you get like a little toy from there. And then I was bullied for liking Pokemon because it was weird and it was Japanese and people were like, that's stuff for nerds. And now it's the number one biggest franchise. And then when Pokemon Go was this giant thing that everybody liked, I already knew all the Pokemon and all this stuff. So I was super frustrated about it anyway. But that's not what we're talking about. I'm not going to go down the Pokemon. I'm really upset about it. I haven't gotten over it. Gave up all my Pokemon cards, probably millions of dollars now. Um, but one that probably more people are familiar with is Star Wars, right? Now, some Christians will just totally write off Star Wars because it's like it talks about the Force. It talks about New Age ideas. That's bad. I'm not going to watch it because there's some things in it that aren't true. There's actually quite a lot in there that are very parallel to the Bible. Some of you know, right? Darth Vader, who was Anakin Skywalker, how was Anakin born? It was a virgin birth. Anakin, who later became Darth Vader, was a virgin birth, and he was supposed to be the chosen one. He was supposed to be the Messiah that brought balance to the Force, right? That sounds very familiar. Now, it's obviously, it goes off the rails when that guy becomes the biggest bad guy in the entire franchise, but there's a little bit of truth there, right? You can use that as a bridge. All right, I might upset some people, but I like, I like getting um, fun emails, so I'm just going to do it anyway. BB said I could, so you can yell at him too. <laughs> a franchise that is near and dear to my heart. Um, it was the first novel I ever read, and it's, it's, it's kind of a topic in evangelicalism and amongst many Christians, Harry Potter. Um, A lot of Christians will look at Harry Potter and go, absolutely not. It's got witchcraft, it's got wizardry, and those things are sin, and that is true. But did you know that in Harry Potter, Harry Potter dies to save the world, and then he's resurrected again, ultimately, to defeat evil? Like, that is amazing. And there's actually biblical verses straight up quoted in the Harry Potter series. Now, instead of going, oh, you watch and listen to Harry Potter, you should repent, you filthy sinner, and never watch or read those things ever again. You can actually use that as a bridge. And you still need to practice discernment. You can't go, well, then it's okay to like wave a wand around and try and cast some spells. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is if we have the eyes to see and we're not just writing off everything that isn't Hallmark or Pure Flicks, right, as long as we have eyes to see from the Holy Spirit and from a biblical worldview, the biblical truths that exist out there, then we can use that stuff to talk to our family members who don't know Jesus yet. To those people in the fandoms where, like, it kind of is a religion to some of these people, right? And then Paul says, we are his offspring. He's using that to basically make a connection here again. He says, we are God's offspring. And we're God's offspring in the sense that he made us in his image and in his likeness. Christianity elevates human beings to such a high level in saying that we are made in his image and after his likeness. We see that in Genesis 1.27. But we need to be adopted by God through faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved from our sins. We see this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Without a proper understanding of God, we see this in where he says, the divine nature, don't think that he is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. That's what mankind does. They use culture instead of using it to praise God, to create a kingdom culture that praises and worships God and loves people. They use culture instead to try and shape man into our own being, in our image. It's what the golden calf basically was. Without a proper understanding of God, Paul notes that man will attempt to make God in his own image, and we'll do it too. Without a proper understanding of God, we're going to project our stuff onto God. Like if you ever ask someone what, who they think God is without a biblical worldview, you very quickly discover that they're just a lot like them, really. They're like, well, I hope God's like me, and he likes the same things I like, and he's okay with the same things that I'm okay with. But once God is revealed through someone's own culture, the last step is to tell them about Jesus. So let me just recap. First, we observe the culture. We actually take it in. We consider it. We think about it. And then we introduce God to people. And then we connect people to God. And then we reveal God through the culture, through the art, and through the media, the music, the movies, 
in the culture around us. And then once that's all done, we preach Jesus. We see this in 30 and 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When it says that God in ignorance overlooked, he overlooked the times of ignorance. That doesn't mean that, well, before Jesus, everyone was like cool with God and everybody got to go to heaven. And then now that Jesus came, now it's actually a lot harder to get in. Like that's not what it's saying at all. It, and it also doesn't mean the opposite. Like, well, before Jesus, all of mankind just like, they just had no hope. It was just, a, it was just an assembly line to hell. Sorry, guys, that's not what Paul is saying here. We are saved before and after Jesus by Jesus, by faith in Jesus. The way that that looked before was you had faith in the coming Messiah in the sacrifice that God was going to provide. We just didn't know his name yet. Something that's really interesting is that when Abraham went to go offer his son Isaac up on the mountain, this really neat thing happens. First of all, God says don't go through with it. That's a really cool part. Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son uh, that, was, that would have been pretty brutal. It was a test. But God says, I will provide for myself the lamb. I'm going to provide my own sacrifice. And then what gets caught in the thicket is not a lamb. It's a ram to tie over until Jesus came. That's what the Old Testament was. It was basically, this ram was symbolic of the Old Testament. And so there is, in every culture that I ever studied in anthropology, there was some glimmer of the gospel. And like we read earlier, God has placed every man so that they might reach out and grope for him. How specifically does that work for like uncontacted Amazonian tribes? It's through nature. Like there are, every culture on earth has this crazy understanding of the constellations. And like I've heard of cultures that have no, no interaction with the Bible who look up at the sky and somehow get that the creator God sent his son down. I'm not kidding you. It's absolutely wild how it works. God gives everybody a chance to repent. And that's what he is requiring here. That's what Paul's saying. Look, now that Jesus came, like he, he overlooked the like kind of the ambiguity of who the Messiah would be, but now like he's come, he's here. We have no excuse. Either you accept Jesus or you reject Jesus. No matter how people before Jesus were saved, he now commands all to repent and believe in his son. And look, even if we reveal gospel truths in the culture around us, even if we connect Star Wars and Pokemon and Harry Potter and all that stuff to the gospel, it'll always be countercultural because of repentance. Amen. Telling people that they need to change and that they need to get on God's track is never going to be popular to people who don't believe in God and who don't submit and worship God. Repentance is really just changing your thinking and your attitudes and submitting to God's way of doing things. This is unpopular because <laughs> it means submitting to an authority. It means submitting to an ultimate authority. But repentance is actually freeing. It is, in a sense, just giving God the reins to your life because, let's be honest, all of us are horrible masters of our own lives, right? It's like working for a boss who changes his mind and his expectations for you day to day. That would be wild, but that's what it's like to be in charge of your own life, your passions, your desires, your dreams, they change all the time. God's don't. His way is so much more stable, it brings so much more peace, and it ultimately brings so much more joy. And we receive that way of doing life when we repent and believe in Jesus. And it's urgent that people repent and place their faith in Jesus because everyone, Paul says, will answer to Jesus for everything they've ever done. I think the Hollywood kind of version of it is like you're going to go up to the pearly gates and Peter's going to have like a big long list there and like either your name's there or it's not there and then there's like he pulls a lever or something and there's a shoot and you go to hell or something if you weren't good enough, right? That's not how it's going to go down. We're going to stand before Jesus Christ, King of heaven and earth and we're going to give an account of our deeds to him. And the bad news is that none of us are righteous in and of ourselves. Apart from him, we got nothing. Our, right, our best works are filthy rags to God. Every one of us would stand condemned. But Jesus offers us his righteousness in this life right now that will carry on into eternity. And we just receive that through faith in his life, death, and resurrection. We read that in Romans 3.22. 
So what's the motivation? Why should I care about the mission? Why should I care about the message? Now that I've got a kid and I just understand how complex life is for most people, I sympathize a lot more with just everybody. Like it is just getting out of the house, man. So much more work. Oh my gosh. It's crazy. So like now I've got to like be concerned about the gospel and also keeping my child alive. Why should I care? Why should I care? We're going to talk about the motivation. Verse 32 and 33. Some mock and others say, tell me more. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Some people were not convinced. Amazing gospel preaching. Amazing bridging between God and the culture and the gospel. And some were completely unaffected by it. And this was from the Apostle Paul, okay? So if anyone's going to convince anyone through just the power of sheer argument, this was the dude. And people remained exactly as they were before they heard the message. And they actually mocked him. They made fun of him. They insulted him. We don't need to be afraid of being insulted and mocked because Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven. That's part of our motivation. That's heavenly reward. Success in evangelism is not the amount of converts. It's in preaching the gospel. That's what determines success. Paul was successful the minute he started preaching the gospel. And it did this part did not matter in term in God's eyes. It was just being faithful to talk about Jesus with people. Not everyone, though, outright rejected Paul's words. Some were interested. They were like, Well, we're gonna hear you again on this, but they needed time. They weren't ready to accept it. And what's really interesting is that ecclesiologists, people who study churches and church growth, estimate it takes about three to seven times to hear the gospel before you even respond to it, before you even make a decision, before you even realize it requires a decision. After I got saved, after I believed in Jesus, some people from high school were like, wow, it's really cool to see just like the seed that was planted when like we would talk about God all the time. I was like, what are you talking about? We talked about God? I don't remember that. You told me the gospel like way before. I have no recollection of that whatsoever. I didn't even know what was being said to me. I didn't even get it. I probably made fun of her. I probably insulted her. I insulted a lot of Christians before I became a Christian myself. It takes a couple times, typically. And also notice that Paul leaves. He wasn't like, okay, well, let me just like keep on explaining it to you. Maybe it'll make sense if I keep on going and going and going. Paul sowed seed. He knew it was sufficient. They had heard about Jesus and the resurrection and the coming judgment, and he gave them a call to repentance. And now it was God's job to grow the seed. It wasn't his job right then and there to make people convert. It's none of our jobs, actually, to convert anyone. It's just our job to proclaim the gospel to people. That's it. That is success in evangelism right there. It's not how effective you are or flash you are or intelligent you are in telling people the gospel. It doesn't matter how many cultural connections you can make between the media and art and the gospel. It doesn't matter. Success just comes from being faithful to make disciples. But what happens next should be the ultimate motivation for us to preach the gospel. In verse 34, we see that some are saved. Verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Some believed. Amen. Some people were delivered from eternal death, eternal destruction, and now they get to live with God and have communion forever, and now they have this gospel-centered community. That's amazing. Some believed. And like Paul was like on his way out, and probably like he didn't even like someone raise your hand, great, or like get you connected. He was just like, all right, bye, I did my job. People were like, wait, 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 wait. No, I, I believe in what you just said. I believe. That's what it took. That's what it took for each one of us, was for one of us to hear the gospel. Whether it came from our parent when we were really young, whether it came way later on in life from a coworker or a family member. All of us had to hear the gospel first and believe. It's kind of silly to think that no one's going to ever accept the gospel when you preach it to them. Like, yes, some are going to mock, some are going to say not yet, and then some are going to actually believe. That is amazing. It's amazing when I start talking to people and I see the light bulbs getting turned on by the Holy Spirit about the truth of the gospel. It's like, oh, wait, yeah, that makes sense. And you're like, what? It does? I mean, yeah, it does, but like, you actually are like believing in this too? Are, did you just get saved right now? It's crazy. We get to look forward to that. Yeah, we can expect persecution when we preach the gospel, 
We're not being killed for our faith. We're not being imprisoned for our faith. But we can expect insults. But we can also expect saved souls. So here's kind of my conclusion. I'm going to ask the band to come on up. I'm going to ask the prayer people to come up too. When we're rooted in God's word, first and foremost, when we're developing, seeking to saturate ourselves in the word of God, either through listening to it on our way to work, on our way home, whether reading it, deep study, whatever it is, however you intake the gospel that is most effective for you. When we are rooted in God's word and obedient to passionately communicate the gospel, he will give us eyes to see, God will give us eyes to see the gospel truths in the, go- in the culture around us. And rather than just like rail against the culture, I really want to encourage us, let's seek to use the culture as a bridge not as an obstacle between people and God, but actually as a bridge to connect people and God through the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are sovereign and you love us and you've ordained all of human history so that we would seek you. I pray we would see you in the culture around us, God. I pray that we would see gospel truths hidden like diamonds and coal, Lord, and that we would use those things to point people to you and glorify you. We can only do this by your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.